The last thing that was going on through my mind was that I would do something historic because Slobodan Milosevic, the architect of ethnic cleansing, was firmly in power. And all of the Western democracies who at the same time as they were condemning the ethnic cleansing were actively doing business with them. Many of you will know about Douglas Heard and how the conservative government for long had very warm relations with the Milosevic regime and how the government of the time blocked every attempt to confront the uh, architects of ethnic cleansing. The point was that people told us that we were fools and naive uh, imbeciles for ever thinking in view of what they called power realities that these individuals would ever be brought to justice. And I begin with this because it seems quite hopeless today when we see the unrelenting brutality of the regime just as a space was opened up to give us hope, to believe that these perpetrators will one day be brought to justice. We have to understand that this is part of a long struggle, that we are closer to that objective than we ever have been, and that ultimately we have to believe that there is power in the principles that we stand for, and that power is greater than any temporal earthly power that those who today have uh, uh, positions of authority may have. I begin this by saying that today, no matter how much we wish that there was some tribunal in The Hague that would prosecute the leaders of the Islamic Republic, it is not likely to happen. I will be very frank with you. And recently, a group of activists who went to the International Criminal Court handed a petition and were given a file number simply because the court received the documents, announced that a case has been opened. I'm afraid to say that that is not what has happened. And I say this because I don't want to disillusion people by raising false expectations. The International Criminal Court, first of all, does not have jurisdiction because the Iranian government predictably has not ratified the statute of the court. Now, why would the Iranian government not ratify that statute? Or rather, why would it ratify that statute when half of its leaders would be prosecuted before that very same institution. Another problem that we confront is that the jurisdiction of that court is restricted to events after 2002. So the 1988 massacres, once again, would not fall properly before that court. And the only other way of establishing a tribunal would be if the UN Security Council were to establish an ad hoc court like those for Yugoslavia and Rwanda, which, as I will explain shortly, is highly unlikely at present because, frankly speaking, most governments don't really care that much about the human rights situation in Iran. They're interested in nuclear non-proliferation, they're interested in the stability of their energy supplies, they're interested in Israel's security, they're interested in everything but human rights. In this context, we have to understand that ultimately, until the regime in Iran is brought to its knees by the people of Iran, by those very same young, heroic people that are willing to stand in front of the bullets, that are willing to go to the prisons and be tortured and raped, that the prospect of bringing these people to justice is not very, uh, 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 at least in an immediate sense, realistic. But there are things that we can do in order to go from where we are today to where we want to be. And we have to understand that it's not an all or nothing proposition. The beginning of the process of bringing these people to justice is the discovery of the truth. The truth has to be made manifest. And the truth is not just about who was victimized, but who were the perpetrators. We have to make sure that those that are responsible for these murders become notorious, so that they know that there is no rock under which they will be able to hide when the day comes. That we will never forget their injustices, whether it's 20, 30, or 40 years. As a modest contribution to this process, the 
Uh, Iran Human Rights Documentation Center has prepared a report which some of you may have seen. It's called Deadly Fatwa. And it is a report which was um, in part based on uh, interviews by a number of very brave witnesses and, and survivors. I would urge all of you to get a copy of this report so you better appreciate the anatomy, the anatomy of this act of mass murder. And also look at some of the pretty pictures which we have of Mustafa Pur Muhammadi and a number of the other perpetrators who I think we need to make more famous than Michael Jackson or Madonna so that they understand that when things change in Iran, they can't just come and enjoy their nice property in Knightsbridge in London or in Toronto, uh, and that they cannot just recycle themselves in Iran, saying that we were always with the people, we were always with democracy and human rights. That is the message that we have to send, that there is a cost attached to committing crimes against humanity. One of the remarkable things about the Green Movement, Green Movement not understood as supporters of Musavi, but a much broader social movement consisting of students and women and labor unions and the broad cross-section of Iranian society. One of the demands now is justice. There are the mourning mothers, including the mother of Sohrab Arabi and others, who are demanding that those that murdered their children be brought to justice. We must, at the same time as uncovering the truth about the perpetrators, ensure that an integral part of any democratic transition in Iran is accountability for past violations. Because if we do not come to terms with the crimes of the past, then we're bound to repeat them. Another point which needs to be made now that we're here in London is the tremendous leverage which the European Union has, which it has not exercised in the past 30 years, in bringing to an end human rights violations in Iran. The European Union is by far the biggest trading partner of Iran, and it has been for the past 30 years. 30% 30 of all exports and imports in Iran come from the European Union, to the tune of 14 billion euros either way. Obviously, there are business interests that have no, in that have no inclination to engage in any sort of confrontation with Iran. I was just in Washington last week briefing members of Congress about the human rights situation in Iran. And I'm sorry to tell you that the mood there is one of engagement, which you can read as appeasement. We need to be realistic and we need to negotiate with Ahmadinejad, who now, because he's weakened, is more likely to make some concessions on the nuclear issue. That is what is going on through the minds of the policymakers. None of them feel sorry for any of the victims. It's up to civil society, whether in Iran or outside of Iran, to speak truth to power. Why does the UN Security Council, in Resolution 1747 from March of 2007, impose travel bans and asset freezes on individuals and companies involved in a nuclear program, but does not do the same for those who perpetrated crimes against humanity. These are demands that we need to make. Why in Honduras, where there is a bloodless military coup, does the European Union withdraw all of its ambassadors, but barely register any significant protest when thousands of people in Iran are beaten, tortured, murdered, and raped. Where is the Europe that speaks in such glowing terms about human rights at a time when the Iranian people are so close to achieving the freedom and democracy that they have struggled for so long? Are these governments going to turn their back on those people just as they have shown that Ahmadinejad does not speak for the Iranian people? I will end simply by saying that the struggle has been long and unfortunately it is not uh, at an end. When circumstances change in Iran, we should have no illusions that we will achieve some sort of paradise or utopia. 
when circumstances change in Iran, it will be the beginning of rebuilding a country that for so many years has indoctrinated its people with lies, deceit, hatred, and violence. And the lesson that we have to learn when we look back at 1979 and the calls by our friends today who are the victims of 1988 who said that the last thing we want is a repeat of what happened in 1979 is that if we do not do justice to the crimes of the past, then we will never achieve an Iran in which a culture of human rights, uh, democracy, and rule of law prevails. Thank you for your attention.